So welcome, good afternoon. I would like to welcome all of you on the 15th meeting of Nobel laureates and talented students. And as a first program of this conference, we will uh, start with excellence, absolutely excellence. In 2013, the foundation established uh, the Senior de Talents Awards and the foundation give only a single researchers every year for an invention. And the invention should be a single discovery. Should the research should be conducted in Seged. And this kind of award, this kind of prize, actually are decided by the uh, curatorial member of the foundation and also the Nobel laureates visiting Seged. So it's really not easy to receive this prize. However, of course, each year we have somebody in Seged who uh, eligible to receive this and uh, in the first afternoon session the last three uh, prize winners will present you their discoveries and their excellence and they not only the prize winners but they also like mentors uh, of the school. Uh, first you will get uh, the chance to have uh, uh, Antal Barini who received the talent prize in 2017 and he currently a faculty member of uh, the University of Szeged and I would like to ask uh, Antal to give the presentation his work. Please Antal. Uh, okay, greetings everyone. Uh, thank you for watching this uh, unusual event. Uh, today we are going to broadcast this presentation instead of giving a, a live occasion because of the pandemics. I'm going to talk about the work that my research group has performed in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years in the field of uh, epilepsy treatment. Uh, maybe it's not very well known, but epilepsy is a pretty common disease. It affects actually approximately 1% of a population throughout the world. And as you can see on this, uh, on this map, it's um, uh, pretty regularly spread across uh, all countries with no respect of the uh, technological or societal or economical uh, development. Uh, the problem with this disorder, which affects, as I said, approximately like 70 million people throughout the world, is that like one third of the patients cannot be treated properly with the currently available uh, pharmaceuticals. So in the last uh, several decades, the pharma industry tried to come up with uh, newer and newer molecules and target points, but uh, unfortunately still this uh, uh, one third or 30% uh, holds, which means that like uh, 20 million people are still seeking for uh, some sort of a new solution. So as you can see on the right side of this slide, um, there are uh, lots of hypotheses that what is in the background of the ineffectiveness uh, of the, of the uh, pharmaceuticals, namely that why does one certain drug uh, being effective in one patient and, and is not effective in another patient, but we have very few answers. So there are uh, some pharmacokinetic uh, issues, there are definitely some gene variations across the, the patient populations. Epilepsy is not a uh, uniform disease, it's a, it's a set of uh, more than 50 uh, different reasons which can uh, end up in, in regular seizures and, uh, and can constrain the life. So if there is no definitive therapy for some patients then uh, uh, needless to say that any additional drugs are uh, going to cause only some uh, 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 suppression, of the uh, suppression of the symptoms, but it is not going to end up in a final solution. So it is understandable that why these millions of people are seeking uh, desperately uh, some new solution. So as I said, uh, there is only 70% of the, of the people whom can be treated with drugs. So let's see what happens with the, with the other 30%. So besides of this uh, huge burden, there is a big issue that most of these non-responsive or non-responder patients are not referred and not re-evaluated for any other treatment modalities. 
So only 40% of them uh, gets to the uh, neurosurgical departments or gets to be evaluated for electrical treatments, which are the two other alternatives. The surgery is easy to understand that it's not a very tempting solution. Uh, basically, what happens during a resective surgery of an epileptic uh, patient is that they surgically remove that part of the brain which is generating the epileptic seizures. Of course, this can only be done if uh, a certain focus of the seizure generator can be identified and, and it is located in that part of the brain which is surgically accessible and it is not maintaining uh, 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 a vital function. Um, this is a very complicated surgery and very expensive and there are uh, not that many centers throughout the world to give access to, to the broad mass of these patients, patients who are, whom are in need. Uh, besides of the surgical uh, removal, there is an other therapeutic modality, neuromodulation, which is most frequently being done using electricity. The most com common form of electrical stimulation of the brain in epilepsy is the so-called VNS therapy, which stands for the vagal nerve stimulation. Uh, and as you can see in total, only 7% of the people who are non-responsive to drug therapies get finally access to either the surgery or the electrical treatment. So there is still 93% of them whom are seeking for a solution. And this is the mission of our laboratory to come up with, with uh, novel ideas and novel therapeutic modalities to, to help these uh, approximately uh, 50 million people. Um, the VNS has the largest access amongst the neuromodulation therapies because it is the least invasive uh, version of uh, uh, epilepsy neuromodulation. In this case, the device, what you can see here, it's uh, actually in market for more than 25 years now in Europe, is uh, stimulating the vagal nerve instead of stimulating directly the brain where the epilepsy is generated. So as you can see, the skull is not needed, needed to be opened. You don't need to have a, a, a neurosurgical background. It's basically a relatively mild surgical operation that can be done relatively easy. And because of the accumulated experience in the last 25 years, uh, it can be done on more than 10,000 people per year uh, throughout the globe now. It is actually introduced in more than 50 countries. Um, and uh, uh, there is a study which did show that just simply because of the fact that these patients whom are receiving this VNS therapy require less pharmaceuticals compared to the others whom are only treated with drugs, there is a very quick economic return uh, of the relatively huge price of this device. Uh, it returns in less than two years. There are two other alternatives though. One of them is the so-called DBS stimulation, which stands for deep brain stimulation, in which case uh, a sharp uh, uh, needle-like electrode is introduced to the brain, to a very specific part, with no respect of what kind of epilepsy the, the patient has. It is always introduced to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, which is in the middle of the brain and then it continuously stimulates uh, that part of the brain. It also applies to the VNS that I introduced previously, that, that uh, it's a free-running open-loop system uh, that is continuously stimulating. Uh, it doesn't matter whether there is a seizure going on or whether it's a healthy brain pattern then. So the invasiveness is much higher in this case. You have to open the skull and uh, put an electrode directly into the brain, so it is much more expensive and much less accessible though. The third uh, relatively common solution is uh, the RNS, the Responsive Neurostimulation, which is a combination of the previously mentioned DBS, so there is a penetrating electrode going into the brain, but in this case the electrode is directly introduced into the focus where, which is generating the seizure. Uh, in addition to that, there are some strips 
uh, uh, lying on the surface of the brain, which is uh, performing a continuous brain monitoring, brain activity monitoring, and the device is making a decision whether the pattern that this electrode strip is uh, watching is a healthy pattern or it is a seizure. And it only introduces stimulation when the seizure is going on. This is what we call as a responsive or closed loop uh, stimulation. So as you can see on this figure, no matter whether we are talking about the DBS, the vagal nerve stimulation, or the responsive neurostimulation, or another one that I did not mention, the efficacy of this therapy is somewhere in the range of the 40-50% only, meaning that it's 50% of the patients are responding at all, and in those whom are responding and, and has, have an improvement in epilepsy, uh, is experiencing only a 50% decrease in their uh, um, uh, seizure frequency. Probably needless to say that this is not an optimal solution. An epileptic patient is seeking for something that is reliably, or that is reliably controlling uh, his or her seizures and can make it sure that he can live a, a complete and unconstrained life. Unfortunately, none of these existing uh, devices can do this. So, in order to do the optimal stimulation, first of all, we have to make it sure that it is temporarily precise, meaning that we don't touch the brain when there is no seizure going on, and we very effectively stimulate when there is a seizure and we, we uh, attempt to terminate it. This offers an on-demand stimulation and does not cause as much side effects as the open-loop uh, modalities like the uh, VNS or the, or the DBS stimulation. Fortunately, we have a technology that we call, actually this is existing for, for like 100 years now, that we call electroencephalography or abbreviated as EEG, uh, which can record the electrical activity of the neurons in the brain in a non-invasive way. So we put electrodes on the scalp and due to the fact that the neurons, when they become active, they are generating an electric field around them. Uh, depending on the synchrony of the neighboring neurons, if they are synchronous and they are working together as, a, as a, um, an audience clapping in the theater after a play, then these very tiny electrical fields add up and generate an electrical signal that is perceivable even from the outside of the skull and the skin. This is what we call as an EEG signal. As you can see in this uh, slide, there is a very striking difference between a healthy brain pattern and an epileptic seizure. So the beginning of this recording, each of the lines are one location on the head, so one EEG signal. So it has some characteristic very high, high frequency and low amplitude pattern. And when a seizure is happening, then this signal is getting slower, so the characteristic frequency becomes lower and the amplitude increases a lot. And then as you can see, if the seizure terminates, then the healthy pattern gets back again. So in order to make an on-demand closed-loop stimulation, the, the uh, algorithmic issue we need to solve is to invent or develop a statistical method that can reliably distinguish this healthy, healthy pattern from the epileptic seizures. It sounds easy, but uh, in practice to make a reliable uh, uh, algorithm with high uh, confidence and high fidelity is, is pretty problematic and still not completely solved. All in all, if this can be done, then if we time the stimulus delivery, so the electrical shocking of the brain, uh, to only to the seizures and to the, to, to the proper uh, moments of the seizure, then the seizures can be immediately and quickly terminated. So as you can see on this figure, which comes from the uh, initial pilot study of the RNS device from the 2010th, the beginning of 2011 maybe, um, uh, you can see that there, was, there is a seizure starting that you can see here, and then one stimulus pulse was delivered and then the healthy pattern uh, comes back. So it can be very effective if it is properly done. Remember that in this case, the electrical stimulus is delivered directly into the epileptic focus deep in the brain. So it's a very invasive, very complicated surgery. My research group have shown uh, that the same effect can be reproduced with less invasivity if the electrical stimulus is also delivered from outside of the head. So you don't have to open the skin, you don't have to open the skull, you can just deliver an electrical pulse crossing the brain 
and then it is also effectively terminating seizures in rodents. So these experiments have been done in rats. We have seen that uh, if we can come up a solution that is less invasive co compared to the currently existing ones, then it would make a big benefit to the patient. So we immediately wanted to uh, go to the transition phase and transfer this technology to the human use. But we were facing some issues. Unfortunately, we have seen that what was working properly in uh, rats had made absolutely no effect in humans. So the st same stimulus intensity that was still tolerable, so it is easy to understand that if we are increasing the voltage and the, the stimulus intensity, then it is getting painful to the patients. So the maximum tolerable intensity did not make any instantaneous change in the brain. We were surprised and we, we went after this and checked that why is there such a huge difference between the rat results and the human results. So we may went to the autopsy room and made some measurements on, on the head of human cadavers where we put electrodes deep in the brain and recorded what is happening inside when we are doing this stimulation. And surprisingly we've seen that because of the much larger dimensions of the human head compared to the rat and to, uh, due to the thicker skull and thicker skin, most of the electricity did not penetrate the brain directly but it was going around and being conducted by the skin. So, by other words, I can say that the electricity had been shunted by the soft tissues and the skull. We also estimated that in order to generate the same effect what we've seen in the rats, we have to deliver at least three or four times larger intensity that is maximally tolerable in humans. So it seemed basically undoable. But this is the point when, uh, when a researcher is, uh, does need to still wake up in the morning, go to the lab and carry on work uh, to, to come up with some solution to the seemingly undoable. At the end, we invented a new stimulation technology that is called intersectional short pass stimulation. It sounds uh, complicated, but in fact, it is a simply, uh, simple approach. We are using multiple electrodes at the same time instead of using only two and we turn on the electricity for each electrode for a very short period of time and we use only one electrode pair at once. Then we switch to the subsequent electrode pair and to the next one and to the next one. And we are basically sweeping uh, the signal throughout these, these electrodes. It is going in the megahertz range, so it, it requires a very fast switching and the integration of these very tiny pulses are done by the cells themselves. So each of the neurons has a so-called temporal time constant. They can merge these uh, very frequent pulses the same way as our eyes are merging the steel frames of a movie, for example. So the reason why we are seeing a, a motion picture when we are watching the TV uh, which is projecting a sequence of steel frames is because our eyes are merging, merging these uh, stimuli. So the same is happening here. And we have also uh, um, proved that in fact this can reach uh, the desired threshold of effect in the human brain. So we tested this on, on rats, of course. So here what you can see on these slides are basically epileptic rats and the severity of uh, epilepsy is estimated or quantified on the so-called Racine's scale which goes from 1 to 5. 1 is the uh, actual the weakest seizure and 5 is the tonic-clonic grand mal seizures where the, where the animal is losing consciousness as well. Uh, so basically uh, level 4 and 5 are the so-called severe seizures. We have seen that when we apply this ISP stimulation, so the sequential, sequential stimulation to the rats, then we can almost completely abolish the severe seizures and they could, uh, they had been stopped before the animal lost consciousness or had any serious consequences. So we are hoping that this is also going to work on humans. So in order to go to the human translational phase, uh, this requires a lots of engineering. Um, in the, in the uh, epilepsy clinics, you cannot use those simply off-the-shelf uh, devices that are available for the, for the animal experiments, but there is a need of a much uh, stricter uh, quality management and, uh, and uh, quality control. So thus, we decided to step into a 10-year-long project, which is targeting the translation of this laboratory device into an implantable 
epilepsy defibrillator, if you like it so, that can be implanted in humans and can be tested whether their epileptic seizures can be kept under control. So it's a complex system, basically. It is using similar uh, electrode strips that are going to be implanted under the skin for, for convenience and for aesthetic issues, as, as we did in the, uh, in the animal experiments. There is going to be a, a central device or a main device that is performing the continuous evaluation of the ongoing brain rhythm and makes the decision whether this is a seizure that, is, that it is seeing or it's a healthy pattern and delivers the stimulus on demand when it is needed. Um, in fact, we hope that the first inpatient experiments with this device are going to take place within the next year. So when the pandemic is over and we can start traveling and the healthcare system becomes available again to make, uh, make uh, proper human studies. Uh, then we are ready to launch with this and come up and I hope that uh, throughout the next year I'm going to be able to I'm going to be able to to report you the first human results of this very new uh, revolutionary technology to terminate seizures. So needless to say that that uh, this work requires the contribution of many people so on this slide I would like to thank the contribution of my lab members whom were responsible for the scientific background of the experiments and on the next slide is the engineering team who put together that marvelous tiny device that was capable to do all this miracle that we could achieve. So thank you very much for your attention. So Anto, thank you very much. I think nobody has questioned why this prize was given to you in 2017. So good afternoon everyone and thanks very much for visiting Seged and, and for part participating at this event. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this. So I also come from the Biological Research Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So this is not part of the university but we work very closely with a lot of links with the university. As a matter of fact we have I think on the order of one or two hundred students, PhD students within this institute. So we already see, seen a spaghetti slide. This is something similar. So really these two pictures represent like the extreme end of the spectrum of human diet that one can have like soybean and, and beef burger. And what, what I find particularly striking is that there is something deep in common in, in those two food types is that basically our body can build up their own molecules from either of them. So basically we might not get exactly the same shape of body, but, uh, but clearly we are able to utilize these nutrients from uh, a large number of nutrient sources. And what is behind this is the process called metabolism, which means that the cell takes up food molecules breaks it down into energy and some very small building blocks that it can be assembled into their own macromolecules like their own DNA, lipids, proteins, and so on and so forth. So behind this kind of magical process is a, an intricate and complex network of biochemical reactions which contains in human body five, six thousand known biochemical reactions which uh, basically an, an elementary step in this network is a single chemical reaction converting one or more uh, molecules into something else. So basically these are the key players, the metabolites, what we call them, are the key players of, uh, of cellular metabolism. Metabolism has been studied for, for many, many decades and one kind of emerging picture is that, that the structure of the metabolic network looks pretty similar even across 
very highly dissimilar species, just to, to quote Jacques Molon here, so what is true for an elephant, so, sorry, what is true for E. coli is also true for the elephant, would really well apply to at least to the central pathways of, of uh, metabolism. But when, if you look at the details, how these metabolic networks work, then actually there are large differences. And nowadays, there are some really nice technologies to measure the behavior of these networks. These are call, call, called metabolomics approaches, which basically is about breaking up cells, getting all the small molecule components, metabolites out of them, and with using either mass spectrometry or some other methods, measure the concent concentration of these metabolites, and we can compare it between conditions, tissues, organisms. So uh, today we can measure like one, two, three hundred metabolites in a single uh, experiment run. And, uh, and, and also these techniques are now pretty cheap, so it can be scaled up to, to measure metabolomes, metabolome profile, that's what we call this, the concentration levels measured across all metabolites, it can now be done for human populations, large populations for thousands of, of people. And actually, these studies reveal that there are quite some variation between uh, how the metabolism of, of those sitting in this room, for example, uh, behave. And some of them are already kind of linked to, to known diseases. Just think about uh, cholesterol level uh, and some other kind of harmful metabolites. So my lab, one of the major goals of my lab is to, to understand better what drives these differences between species and between individuals, what are the evolutionary forces. And uh, clearly some of these differences might be beneficial. For example, some, it has been shown that some uh, brain lipids are very different in chimp and, and human, and, and it has been linked to some cognitive capabilities. Some others are, like what I mentioned earlier, some are linked to diseases. So if you have a higher cholesterol level, it predisposes you to certain diseases. But many of these changes might not matter at all. What we call in evolutionary biology as neutral might not have functional consequences. But in general, we have examples of all of these, but in general, we just don't understand what metabolic differences would uh, give rise to functional or non-functional differences in general. So, and the related question, of course, is that if we would understand better, if we could understand better what drives metabolic differences, then we might use it to increase uh, the accuracy of diagnosis. I will come back to that later. So what are the tools that we use to study these questions? On the one hand, we are running, a, actually we set up a metabolomics lab in, in the institute and, and measure metabolites uh, directly, actually mostly from unicellular organisms. On the other hand, and as far as I know, this is probably the, the first place in Hungary where where kind of large-scale metabolomics is done, so more than a few dozen, up to several hundred metabolites can be quantified. And on the other hand, which actually is, is kind of the major activity of the lab, is to do bioinformatics analysis, both of our own data and a lot of published data. There are a lot of published data for human, for example, and even for several mammals that can be used. And to use this data, analyze in the context of the metabolic network to understand how these metabolite level changes, changes might uh, uh, translate into functional consequences. As a matter of fact, if, if I can give you one advice, if you, if you are really into biological sciences, then learn programming, just at the very basic level. But that's, for me, that was probably the most useful skill I got uh, during high school. Uh, because there are so much data out there in almost all fields in biology today, you generate an order of magnitude more data than just five, 10 years ago, and there is just no way you can analyze them by manually or, or, or uh, just by looking at them by eye. So one of the, one of the major aim we pursuing is to, to understand, uh, to, to try to 
identify those metabolites in those parts of metabolisms that really matter during evolution, that selection really cares about. These are the most conserved ones, and probably they are functionally the most important ones. So as an analogy, uh, one can use evolutionary approaches to find these functionally important places uh, or functionally important changes. And in, uh, as an anal analogy, in genomic sciences, when, when the DNA sequence is determined for different organisms, it's quite commonplace to then line up them and compare the sequences across different species and identify those sides, those letters in the DNA, which, which do not tend to change compared to those that change much more. And it turned out, and it has been very useful in all s fields of biology, that, that we, we can read out a lot of functional information about how the genes function, actually where are the genes, what, what are their most important parts, and so on and so forth. So the hypothesis or our idea, which, which, are, which has started recently, to explore is whether we can use, in a similar manner, comparisons of metabolomes across different species to learn something about which parts of metabolisms that natural selection cares most about. So here we took, uh, uh, it's actually the metabolome profile was, was measured for a lot of different mammals in a, in a previous study. It, it was for, uh, to identify like longevity related metabolic changes. And we use this, this data to, to identify kind of those metabolites that are the most conserved in the metabolic network. And it turns out that, that these comparisons make sense because disease metabolites that are known to cause inherited metabolic disorders like phenylketonuria and these kind of things are overrepresented in these conserved sets. So indeed, what uh, matters for uh, for evolution also has some disease relevance. So now like a future goal is to, to somehow use this evolutionary information in interpreting what is called personal metabolome profiles to predict risk, disease risks. So it is, it is now becoming a big business to measure metabolome profiles, the metabolite concentrations from blood, of uh, actually apparently healthy individuals, like all of us could go to, to, to these services and get our, metab or, or blood uh, profiles for their metabolome maybe every few months or so. And then one can take a look at this profile and ask whether there are some changes compared to the population average. And more or less that's the method that people use these days to, to, to figure out whether one has a higher or lower risk of disease. Now our idea is that probably we could make use of evolutionary information to focus only those changes that really does matter for natural selection. So the kind of the end goal is to come up with a disease risk score that incorporates uh, these evolutionary information. So my lab looks a bit like a metabolic network here. This, and this is not a coincidence because it's a network of young, talented people who, who work together on various topics. And the larger part of the network is devoted to, to data analysis and computational biology, and smaller to experimental biology. If you want to learn about not just our lab's research, but also other kind of uh, uh, network science and systems biology research, then please visit this, this uh, website. You might find some useful information there. And of course, we, are, uh, we have a lot of collaborations, both within the Institute and internationally. I would just like to highlight one here, Marcus Lazer, who is an expert on developing cutting-edge metabolomic uh, techniques to measure uh, metabolites. Uh, in the Francis Crick Institute, and we have a good connection. So actually some people from my lab spent uh, longer periods in his lab to get trained. So with that, I would like to thank your attention. Let's go for the 2019 uh, talent prize winners, actually Peter Horvath, 
who will speak about a single cell analysis if you see the research is going to uh, really really to a molecular level and uh, last year Peter had a fantastic discovery and were published in the nature communications and already cited uh, plenty of times and uh, I will, would like to ask Peter to, to deliver his speech. So Peter, the stage is yours. Welcome everybody, my name is Peter Horvat. Uh, I'm the director of the Biochemistry Institute at the Biological Research Center in Szeged as well as uh, a senior scientist and group leader at the uh, FIM uh, Institute for Molecular Medicine, Finland, Helsinki. And I'm going to talk about uh, life beyond the pixel, uh, pixels image analysis uh, methods uh, uh, aided by artificial intelligence and how they are used f to analyze microscopy data uh, in biological context. Uh, so, my group, which is called Biomag, the Biological Image Analysis and Machine Learning Group, has a research activity in, dif in four different fields. The first one is uh, image quality improvement, uh, during which we try to improve the quality of the images acquired by a microscope. Secondly, image segmentation and tracking methods to find individual cells and eventually track them over time. And, uh, machine learning and machine learning based phenotyping of cells, for example, to decide whether a uh, cell is a cancer cell or infected by a virus uh, and so on. And finally, I'm going to talk about a method called correlative light light microscopy to isolate single cells from their native environment for the reason to learn the, uh, their molecular content. Uh, so I'm going to drive you through these four topics of my talk, starting from image quality improvement. If you see a picture like this, uh, for a human eye, you see uh, beautiful columns, couples, the sea. Probably it's not very obvious for a human eye to to recognize that the corners of the image uh, differ much uh, from the middle. And if we would make an intensity plot, it turns out that the middle is like uh, often three, four times more uh, shiny than the corners. But our, our, our eye is tuned for that uh, problem. It's called vignetting or uh, uh, illumination uh, correction problems. Uh, and probably it's not a surprise that this the same same phenomenon is there also in uh, microscopy. Here you see a mouse kidney, yeast cells, cancer cells, and all acquired by microscopes. And you see how bad they are uh, in terms of a illumination problem. And uh, when we realized that, we decided to develop methods to overcome this problem. And uh, we published the CIDR method. Uh, which is a general illumination uh, correction method for optical microscopy. And you see the results uh, of CIDR in the bottom, uh, bottom row. Uh, and you see that, that all the images are, are like uh, most uh, uh, equivalently uh, smooth. So the idea of CIDR is that we have a true image this true reality actually goes through an optical system, which is usually an objective and a, a digitizer system, which is usually a CCD or CMOS camera. And throughout this way, the, oops, the, the original image gets noisy, gets illuminated, uh, get also additive uh, noise from the acquisition system. And from a real picture, we actually end up having a, a distorted image. And we said, if we was having an infinite amount of these pictures, and we stack them, and we assume that all the objects have the same distribution uh, across the, the space, then picking any of the image uh, actually uh, should, uh, sorry, any of the pixels should have the same distribution of intensities. 
unfortunately because of these uh, illumination problems it no, it's not true and the corners have different distribution and for that we developed a method based on energy minimization which actually overcomes this problem and, and, and does the uh, probability dist distribution similarity uh, and this is a cider and it was used for 12 different microscopy techniques uh, even we used for outdoor cameras and took pictures in the national galleries uh, and it turned out that it highly dominates over calibration techniques and and uh, at the moment this is this is the state of the art in the world uh, for for basically all the microscopy techniques it's, it's used it has certain different implementations uh, in in different programming languages so if you want to do microscopy I very highly recommend to use this so once we have the images uh, corrected and flattened the next step is to find out objects on these images. For that I'm going to use this picture what you see there. Uh, this is a, an earlier publication we had in science um, with regards to influenza infection. We were interested in what are the different factors which uh, drugs or genes which influence the infection, early infection of influenza. and. Uh, these fluorescence images actually composed of different fluorescent channels which actually all paint one uh, compartment of the cell like the nucleus, the virus particles or the cytoplasm and the task what we do is to detect the cells to find their cellular compartments and then to extract features to describe uh, everything with numbers so basically, starting from an image, we end up having a segmented image on which all of the single particles and, and pieces and bits are detected by the computer, like all the nuclei or the particles uh, of the viruses or the cytoplasms. Uh, and we are almost there. Uh, this is not what a doctor wants. The doctor wants numbers. Uh, and for that, we measure the properties of the cells. So, for example, their morphology, how big they are, how, what is their area, their intensities and textures. And at the end, starting from an image, we get a bunch of numbers, for example, a matrix for this image, which contains all the properties of the cells uh, arise on this picture. This is almost okay, but Unfortunately, microscopy is very challenging and uh, oftentimes uh, we don't have proper staining, we, on, we only have uh, just light penetrating through or cells are growing on the top of each other, they have ugly shapes and so on. And for that, my group develops methods which, which can actually resolve this. I brought you a few of these. First of all, if cells are actually sitting on the top of each other. So if cells are sitting on the top of each other, as for example here on this picture, then it's very difficult to separate them, like classical methods absolutely fail. And we said that if we want to separate them, we have a couple of prior information which we can build into the system. Firstly, uh, if two cells are on the top of each other using microscopy, the intensities on the adjunctions are higher. So we built that in and also we said that cells look circular. So having these two information, you actually can build a model which incorporates uh, circularity as well as allows overlap. And with that too, we were able to publish the ML model that, that you see the results on the right side was able to separate single cells at a, a rather high quality. You can also apply that method to uh, tissues, for example, or breast cancer tissues, where you see the image is very challenging and we were quite successful to find all the cells. Another very often happening thing is when cells are not touching, uh, sitting on the top of each other but touching each other and in in this case uh, we observed something very interesting that um, if we look at the contours of them there are two uh, distinguished points where the so-called curvature goes up and it, we said that if if these curvatures are opposite to each other and they are not very far, then we generate energies which actually split them. And we came up with this mod uh, model 
uh, this splitting model where we said that the contour should align on the edges of the cells first and secondly if there is this high curvature places opposite to each other then they, sh they should cut and, and putting these all together uh, we were able to come up with this model that actually successfully can split uh, all the cells um, even if there is no supporting image information and uh, this is what we did in the last 10 years and then uh, one and a half years ago there was a competition the Kaggle Data Science Ball competition which was uh, uh, probably the largest ever com bi bioinformatics competition in the world with 4000 participating groups where the task was to find nuclei on diverse microscopy images you see a couple of examples here so basically you had to write a program that finds nuclei on, on, on any, any sort of image and uh, well, I said my team did that for the, for the last 10 years, so we should be good off. Unfortunately, we were in the first 1000 or so, but definitely not very good. So it turned out that everyone was using uh, machine learning, especially deep learning methods, and we also changed to that. And with using deep learning, uh, we were able to go to, well, probably position 100. But it also turned out that, that deep learning methods are really hungry of, for data and we did not have enough data uh, so we had an idea which is called image style transfer learning where you have a basis you have a style and you can plot that basis in that style or probably this is a more familiar picture a German city famous painters paintings and as as of the German city was painted uh, in the style of these uh, painters and we said if it's possible to do it with real images, probably you can do it with cell images. So we took a real cellular image and we said, I want to have a, uh, a cell here and here and here and here and there and other images. So we started to generate from original images to like original looking fake images. And we started to train the method with these. And that resulted this method we call the nuclei.org a nuclei uh, that 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 actually got the first position on this competition and this is probably uh, to our knowledge the best method at the uh, at the moment in the world um, segmenting single cells uh, i brought you another very interesting project uh, uh, regarding deep learning which is a detection of astrocytes so astrocytes are the de detection in in the brain uh, sorry, uh, exercises are cells in the brain and our task was to detect them uh, flawlessly uh, which is a very complex task because they are very, very, very difficult looking ones and even for a human eye it's not easy. So what we did, we asked uh, doctors from uh, um, like uh, neurologists uh, and, and asked them to mark a couple of them and then in two weeks later we asked them again and then we compared how they, they performed. And very interestingly, what turned out is that computer is as good in recognition uh, um, of, of uh, astrocyte cells as, as doctors are. So, so I'm not saying deep learning is, is really a tool for everything, but for very particular, even difficult tasks, it can really, really perform well. OK, so if you go back to, the, to our influenza slides, uh, we started from a picture and then we have an, uh, numbers now. So what to do with this lot of numbers, what we extracted from the images? And for that, my group is run, uh, actually running a technology and software called the Advanced Cell Classifier. The aim of the Advanced Cell Classifier is to provide very accurate analysis with minimal user interaction using machine learning methods. Just to show you how we do it, uh, we have an image and uh, for example, the image what you see here is, is derived from uh, renal cancer patients and, and we are interested in how efficient drugs are in treating uh, certain cancers and, and or, or imaging questions how many proliferating cells are in, uh, amongst the, uh, like all the cells and we have a green marker on those cells which are actually dividing and of course we want to find drugs that prohibit uh, cell division. So we train the machine to recognize uh, 
dividing cells, non-dividing cells, other cells, and by doing so, uh, the machine can learn and generalize to others, uh, like any other cells, and then uh, we can automatically ask the machine what was the efficiency of a certain drug. Um, at the moment, we are working with a, a group from the Harvard uh, University to bring all these technologies to the web and 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 like uh, create a web technology which uses deep learning from the browser. You can actually look at it in Saito.ai. And now, in the second part of my talk, I would like to show you a couple of uh, examples where we used uh, these technologies. Firstly, about childhood leukemias, where we use it. Uh, so the, the basic idea is that we take bone marrow cells from a patient, and then we put uh, leukemic cells on uh, of the same patient. And if we treat the bone marrow cells with drugs, we are interested in what happens to the um, what happens to the cells of the bone marrow and also the leukemic cells and, and of course the target is to kill all the leukemia cells but not harm the bone marrow. So we developed deep learning methods for that and here the problem is that because it's, it's living human cells it's very difficult to stain them with fluorescence. We only were able to find one simple fluorescent uh, fluorophore that stains everything but we need to separate the one and the other type the leukemia and the bone marrow and with deep learning we were able even with in very ugly looking situations when the red cells are the leukemia and the green cells are the, are the bone marrow and we are very proud of uh, this because uh, because we already treated like 200 patients uh, helping uh, uh, based on based on this uh, method um, so, the next step um, I wanted to discuss is, is 3D. So my group is, is in general interested in analyzing images of uh, like, many, ma like a large amount of images. And for a couple of years now we know that three-dimensional cultures represent human being or, or in general f physiology much better than 2D. And therefore we are developing many things in 3D. And I want to show you where we are at the moment. So first of all, if we want to create three-dimensional models, especially for example for drug treatment, then we need uh, a uh, very unified uh, type of thing, uh, uh, cultures, for example spheroids, what we work with like cellular spheroids, and we just published a method uh, called the spheroid picker, which actually picks a very controlled way uh, cellular organoids and puts them into drug, and so the spheroid picker works so that we screen all the spheroids within, within a whatever holder and then we can select what is the size or roundness or whatsoever criteria of what and then with a small robot we can go there and pick it up and then put it into the drug. We are also interested in the imaging of these uh, large three-dimensional cell cultures. Uh, so um, what you see here is, is our current microscopy setup, which is really able to dissect these, uh, these, these large spheroids at a single cell level. And then we can go also in three dimension into, into these structures and get them analyzed even in uh, 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 like cell by cell. And of course the computational methods are the most important. So my colleagues just de developed uh, this 3D cell annotator program which really can find these single cells at, um, at, at the deep of the, of the 3D cloud uh, and, and, and analyze them. Okay, and very lastly about single cells. So I was showing you how to image a, a single, uh, like image cells, how to correct them, how to find them, how to decide whether they are cancer or not. So in, it's a little bit, like a, a lit, very little step to move, make, like move forward and get that single cell out of the tissue. So we were working on the method called KAMI, where we start either from cell culture or tissue culture 
and do automated microscopy on them and then use machine learning to find the single cells and then decide what they are like cancer non-cancer and then we have a, a small little laser that actually goes there and cuts out that single cell and then we can do further analysis what you see here is a laser beam which can cut it out and shoot it up and then we can collect it in and then we can do uh, molecular analysis like what you see here is really how our laser cutting machine cuts the single cells based on artificial intelligence selection and and coordination at one single micron precision and then we can choose those ones which which we want to so currently we are working with the who to redefine a couple of cancer types uh, uh, like the pathology of, of, of certain cancer types based on this selection and, uh, and isolation and, and molecular properties. Uh, another project where we use it uh, is deep visual proteomics, which is our new project where we take human sample, do machine learning to decide the single cells, cut them out, do ultra-sensitive proteomics to know like the single cell, the map of the single cells, if you wish, at the proteomic level and then feed it back to clinics. We do that um, with the support of the Chansukebeg initiative as well as the Horizon 2020. And, and, and that project will be like really, really a pioneer in terms of like how sensitive we can be uh, in, in precision uh, of, of single cells. And uh, one other single cell project what we are carrying out is how can we pick a single cell in a human brain like using similar techniques but really in 3D and we, we, just, we just built a method called the auto patcher where you take a human brain like a piece of a human brain still living cells uh, which looks actually ugly because we do not have fluorophores uh, in, uh, to stain live cells. But if we can find the single cells, then we are uh, able to fully automatically control a patch clamp into that single cell and either measure its electrophysiology or, or, or even isolate it. So what you will see now in, in, in the next video is that a computer fully automatically selected an interesting cell, controls the pipette automatically to that single cell, and then starts the measurement on it, uh, like patch, patch clamps it automatically. Um, and finally, my group is also uh, very interested in, in the COVID fight. Uh, we published a couple of papers together with a, with a large group of people, the Human Lung Atlas. Actually, we shed light on uh, where the coronavirus uh, uh, infects most, and it turned out that this is the nasal goblet. And very lastly, my, my group was also playing an important role in discovering neurofilin, which is um, a co-host factor of SARS-CoV-2 uh, that was published in Science a week ago. And here we, use <coughs> we used the microscopy techniques, what, what uh, I was showing here. And with that, if you want to read a bit more, then we have a couple of review papers. I would like to thank to my Finnish group, my Hungarian group, those who gave money, and my collaborators. And thank you very much for your attention. So, Peter, thank you very much for your presentation. That was really, really excellent. Uh, uh, and, and this one hour uh, uh, gave me actually uh, even more motivation for that program because these presentations showing us that uh, we really, really have high quality mentors. And I would like to be a student now and start uh, any of uh, yours laboratory. Now it's time for break. Uh, we will have 20 minutes. But please come back because the next session will be the awardee session. And uh, the foundation not only would like uh, to give the prize for the best senior de talent, but also we would like to give a talent prize for the best secondary school students and also the best university school students. So, in 20 minutes break 
and 320 we will start with the award uh, to the best secondary school students after the university students and the top of the next session will be the presentation of the 2020 Senior Talent Award. Please come back. <laughs>